came from the sanctuary, First Baptist Church at Boone, on the corners of King and College Street. Faith community, neighbors and friends, we're glad that you are joining us for this experience of worship on this beautiful Lord's Day in our hometown. We're glad that you have joined us on this, the Lord's Day. You just heard Faye and Jesse play our prelude and bring us into worship, playing all things bright and beautiful. I sent out a questionnaire about, have you seen God today? Have you seen God this week? What is one example of you seeing God's presence bright and beautiful this week? One of our deacons, Carolyn Schull, shared these words. I want to share them with you. Yesterday and today have been so beautiful. A needed respite from the dreary, cool, and sunless days we have experienced lately. My spirits have been lifted, sitting outside listening to the birds, watching butterflies light on new brightly colored flowers, getting my fingers in the dirt. All have been great for me. Reminding me yet again of all the goodness that God bestows that we so often take for granted. All things bright and beautiful in the midst of our daily living, in the midst of our mountaintop experiences and valleys, God delivers. God makes self known all things bright and beautiful. Hear our call to worship our psalm this morning, Psalm 66. I'm going to read verse 16 and verse 20. Come and hear all you who fear and worship God, and I will tell what he has done for me. Verse 20. Blessed be God because he has not rejected my prayers or removed his steadfast love. This day, hear God call each of us to stand and tell a story, to share with one another the presence of God in our lives, where we see God in all things bright and beautiful. Let's pray together. Oh, precious God, send your spirit <clears throat> into this place. We have gathered to worship. We have gathered in our home or by ourselves, maybe on a deck or porch or in the car, listening to worship, experiencing worship by means of Facebook Live and YouTube. And so, God, I, I pray that your spirit permeates each listener and each participant of worship and allows them to experience your word through sacred music played and sung and words read and spoken, scripture shared. Oh, thank you, God, for your presence today in worship. Bless each one gathered, seeking you, seeking to see you this week. God, make evident and real to each of us your presence in all things. All things then become bright and beautiful. May this worship experience please you, O oh God, and be in your keeping. May you alone be honored. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen.
Thank you so much, Jesse and Faye and Billy Ralph, Robin, for being congregation and leading us in music because he lives. What a wonderful hymn experience this morning on this continued Sunday of Easter as we celebrate and worship together during Easter tide. Wherever you gather, uh, I do pray that uh, you will share with anyone that might be with you a prayer concern, a time that you need, you know, add to the worship experience by sharing. Uh, pray for me for this. Or I'm praying for you. And so we need to truly continue to pray for one another as a church. And this part of our worship experience is, is the time of prayer for the people. And there are many needs. Uh, we try very hard as a church family and community of faith to, to share with one another throughout the week the prayer needs and concerns of our community. On Wednesdays, we share the prayer list through email and social media and opportunities to make sure everyone knows the needs of our community. Uh, we share a time of encouragement and, and prayer on Wednesdays. And so the prayer list is quite large. Uh, the needs of our people and of our community, of our, our hometown, our, our state, our nation, and our world. This morning added to our prayer list from yesterday is a dear, dear sweet lady in our congregation, uh, Alice Denton, has gone to be with the Lord. So we just thank God for her, her presence in worship, her faithfulness to this community, her love for music, her love for people, but especially her love for her husband, Robert. And so we need a, to really pray for Robert and the family, this loss of, of a matriarch, really, this loss of a woman who loved life. I'll miss her terribly from, as a pastor. She allowed me to be her pastor. And we traveled a lot, Robin, and Roy and the seniors traveled a lot together. It was always a joy to hear her stories and hear her experiences. 
and listen to her and Robert share of their joy and their love for each other and their desire to live. We also want to remember our church leadership. Add that to your prayers, the administrative council and, and all of our leaders as we continue to discern the best process, the best policies, the best protocols to, to help us gather again together in the safest and best way. And so as that's around the corner, you'll be communicated with and you'll continue to hear uh, what that is. And we want to be sure that every decision and discernment we make makes it crystal clear uh, that we love our neighbor. That we're going to consider the demographics of our congregation and we're going to seek God's guidance and the guidance of the Holy Spirit to lead us uh, in doing what's next. But I pray that this experience uh, is healthy and helpful to you as we worship together. So let's pray. Holy God, hear our prayers. Accept our prayers on the behalf of others. We pray for the grieving and we, we desire that you grant them comfort, strength, and peace. We pray for our sick, God, and we call on you, the great physician, to touch their broken bodies. And we pray for your healing hand upon them. We pray for doctors and nurses and caregivers that gather around them and minister in many ways to, to these that are sick. And lots of times they are there on our behalf for we can't, can't be present in a hospital or a place of care as folks that are sick are being taken care of. God, we pray for our frontline workers. We pray for our officials and we pray for those in our hometown that, that keep us safe and protect us and, and seek to, to be uh, the guide that we need to lean on uh, as we seek to be community. We seek to love and care. For one another. Oh God, in this day of worship, may we truly hear the words, do not grow weary in doing good. Help us, God, to seek and pursue peace. And may your peace be real and evident in our world as we seek to be church, as we seek to be neighbors one to another. Oh God, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Filling the sanctuary with the sounds of the doxology by the organ and the flute are truly a, a great worship experience. And I pray that, that you uh, participated in worship during that time and, and sang those words that are so familiar to you. May they be a reminder of, of the opportunity you have to worship uh, through giving. So I pray as you seek uh, to worship God that uh, you'll continue to, to send in tithes and offerings to First Baptist Church. There's opportunities for online giving, but also the mail is... Uh, continued, continually checked, and those offerings are received. You have been a gracious people, and so thank you for your giving to this church as we seek to, to be mission and do ministry in our hometown for the needy, the hurting, and the most vulnerable. Thank you. Any discussion of giving has to include an awareness that, that many of you out there are hurting. That means that, that, that work's not maybe not even there for you or that your business has had to close down or scale way back. And so we are very sensitive and aware of the, the needs that you have in your own life and the differences possibly that are in your life financially. And so in hearing us uh, seek and help you to worship through giving and tithing, please hear us also say we know and we're beside you and with you and hear you and are praying for you. Our New Testament text this morning the scriptures that I want to read to you, we will continue in the letter from Peter, and it's 1 Peter, 
And I'm going to read from chapter 3, beginning with verse 13. 1 Peter 3, 13 and following. Now who will harm you if you are eager to do what is good? But even if you do suffer for doing what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear. Do not be intimidated, but in your hearts sanctify Christ as Lord. Always be ready to make your defense to anyone who demands from you an accounting for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and reverence. Keep your conscience clear so that when you are maligned, those who abuse you for your good conduct in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if suffering should be God's will, than to suffer for doing evil. For Christ also suffered for sins once and for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which also he went and made a proclamation to other spirits, the spirits that were imprisoned who in former times did not obey when God waited patiently. For example, in the days of Noah, during the building of an ark in which a few, that is, eight persons saved through water and baptism, which this prefigured, now saves you not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is now at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers made subject to him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. What a beautiful musical meditation. Let all things now living. This message this morning is about do not grow weary in doing good. It's the post-resurrection of Jesus, Peter, admonishing his church, telling the early church, these followers of Jesus, do good. Do not grow weary or stop in doing good. The challenges around us are greater, or maybe not greater, but different than any challenges we, I have ever experienced. And so in seeking God's guidance and in reading God's word, there, there is great comfort and strength and power to be found. And so I pray that you'll hear God's word as, as we share together Peter's leading the church to continue to seek and to do that which is good. Children love to ask that question. Or I hear children in my life ask the question, did I do good, Mom? 
Did I do good, Dad? What'd you think about that, Granddaddy? Teacher, did I, did I give you the right answer? Did I do good? Coach, am I on the right track in the right place? We, we want to do good, and we seek lots of voices of encouragement in telling us we're doing good. Peter really wants the listener, the reader, the follower of Jesus, the early church, the church in 2020, to seek God's direction, to seek Holy Spirit guidance, to seek the Word of God to understand what truly is doing good. 1 Peter 3, verse 13, uses the word eager. Eager to do good, a desire to do good, not a wringing of hands and checking a box or it's on your list of things to do today, be good, but be eager to do good. Not just a command or not just a requirement, but an eagerness, a way of life to do no harm. For Peter says, for in doing good, blessed are you, even when it's hard, even Maybe when suffering. In verse 11, the definition of do good is clear for Peter. It is the pursuit and the seeking of peace. So eager follows those words or synonymous with those words. Eager, pursuing, seeking peace. What is the blessing? Peter says in verse 12, when we are eager to do good, when we pursue peace, We are heard. God has ears open to our prayers and eyes directly on you. God hears us and sees us. And the blessing of that sight from God and those ears from God occur when we seek to do good, when we pursue peace. That is needed desperately in the May of 2020. It's needed desperately when Uh, Wednesday afternoon, I was sharing our prayer time on Facebook Live, and I dropped the phone, picked it right back up, and I was just, oh, no, the phone dropped. We got it back on and continued a prayer time together, and and the humanness of that dropping a phone seemed to resonate with the listener. I know the challenges of worshiping live stream bring us kind of an anxiety sometimes. Relax, relax. There may have been a pause or a break or a sound up and down, but relax. We have gathered to worship God, not praise the methodology or praise the instrument that's providing our worship experience. We are to seek doing good, pursuing peace. And I sure was talking to Roy there. 1 Peter 3, verse 16, gives us three pieces of equipment that we need to handle, that we need to experience, that we need to allow God to create in us in this pursuit of peace, this eagerness of doing good and not growing weary. 1 Peter 3.16 says the three are gentle, reverence, and honesty. Peter uses clear conscience. Honest, gentle, reverent, and honest. That's the equipment that we need to wear, that we need to be about, that are def- definitions of who we are as individuals, as a church, as a community of faith, and then a community at large living with one another. So let me ask just two or three questions. What times, what times or experiences, what challenges are you facing right now that lead you to do anything but be gentle, reverent, and honest? What stirs up in you a desire to be anything but gentle, anything but reverent, anything but honest, or at least a desire to push an agenda rather than a letting go and being sincere and honest? Are there experiences that have caused you suffering? Peter is talking about the suffering of this early church, the suffering of the follower Are there experiences that have caused you suffering due to your own behavior? Think for just a moment. Experiences of suffering that are due to your own behavior. Think about gentle 
as the equipment that God is giving us, that the Holy Spirit is pouring upon us and, and, and calling us to be gentle in spirit. Are there experiences that have caused you to be the very opposite of gentle, disrespectful, defensive, harsh, rude? Are there experiences that have caused you suffering due to your own behavior that manifest themselves exactly as the opposite of reverent? Cocky, impolite, flippant, unprepared, reverent. Are there experiences that have caused you suffering due to your own behavior that are the opposite of honest? We would claim honesty. We would all claim honesty, telling the truth. But think through that. Are we more often insincere, phony, assuming, misleading? It's important, Peter says, that we focus, you and me, on our own behavior, our own choices, our own discernment in this following of the gift that was Jesus on earth and the presence of the Holy Spirit as we follow God. We, we often want to focus on the behavior of everyone else rather than our own. We're quick to say, but look what he did or look what she did. Most likely, there's times we've suffered at the hands of someone's, someone else's behavior or action. There's, there's no doubt about it. We're learning more and more what community means. The actions of one, how it affects the actions of thousands. And also likely you, have, you may have caused suffering of someone else by your behavior. So, so this morning as we hear these words and this admonition from Peter and this, this call to be gentle and reverent and honest, don't, don't just go quick to, they're not honest. <laughs> they're sure not reverent. Well, I've never seen a gentle moment in that person's life. Peter's talking to you. Peter's talking to Roy. We've shared in these Sundays of Easter, this post-resurrection Jesus time on earth. Thomas wanting so desperately to see Jesus with his own eyes because the other disciples got to. Or those on the Emmaus Road so disturbed at what they'd seen and experienced, lost and in despair, encountering the risen Lord. And then through the words of Peter over the last couple of Sundays, hearing Peter admonish the new church upon this rock, upon your faith, Peter, I will build my church. So Peter's plea in verse 21 and 22 of our text in the 13th chapter is a call to each of us to appeal to God. Here these are active words, not passive. Eager, pursue, Seek, now Peter says, appeal to God. Cry out to God. Beg God for new life. For new life is possible through the presence of the Holy Spirit. For we can know a risen, living Lord. Be eager to do good, defined as a life style. A life in pursuit of peace. Only possible through the resurrection of Jesus, not on our own strength, but through the power and the presence of the resurrected Jesus. 1 Peter 3.15, I remind you, and it's similar to the psalm I read at the very beginning of our experience of worship, always be ready, Peter says, to give a defense of what gives you hope. Our call to worship in Psalm 66 said, come and hear what God has done for me. So let's hear that. Come and hear what God's done for me. Let me tell you where my hope is found, where my hope lands, what I place my hope in, what God has done for me and you, not all the things I've done for you. <laughs> not stories of, don't you remember everything I have done for you? No, let me tell you what God has done for you. The text in the New Testament gospel lesson of John 14, I read it about every funeral, the first four verses of John 14. 
For Jesus tells the disciples, I'm I'm getting ready to leave. I'm not going to be with you. And I go and prepare a place for you. And I'm not going to tell you anything that's not true. So I promise you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if it wasn't so, I would tell you something different. And the place I go to prepare with you and for you is with heavenly hands, not earthly hands. A place that can never be destroyed. Great words. We've watched, Robin and Roy have watched two doves deciding to land on our front porch and build a nest right on top of a column. This season and this life and this year, that's not been so bad. So it's become an entertaining experience as we watched those doves protect a nest and take turns protecting a nest. And the eggs being in that nest and the eggs hatching. And it's incredible how the size of baby doves. And then watching mom and dad fly away and come back, fly away and come back. And then finally one of the little ones flew away. And then there was a a day just a couple days ago now that that the remaining baby dove was in the nest. And it was just sitting there. And it would stretch its wings sometimes. And it was sitting there. And it would look at you, but it kept, kept sitting there. And it was hours and hours and hours and hours. And it waited and it waited and it waited. And mom came and fed that little dove one more time. And then not too, late, too much later, the dove went to the ground and flew away. Jesus says, I go away. But I go away to prepare a place for you. And you can count on it. Are you waiting on a place that was prepared with heavenly hands? Or is your hope in that which is built and founded on earthly hands? We need to be good with God, not place our entire hope and faith in an earthly home. Jesus says, where I am, you will be with me also. Is your hope in John 14, 16, When he says, I'm sending one to you, just as we wait, as that dove might be waiting. I am sending one to be with you. I'm sending an advocate to be with you after I'm gone. The Spirit will come and live with you and abide with you. And so Jesus is reminding us and telling us we need spirit, not flesh. Just like we need a heavenly home, not just invest our entire hope on an earthly vessel or home. We need spirit, a spirit that will be with us forever. And John says, you'll know the spirit because you know me. And the spirit abides in you. John 14, 18, a place of hope. John says and records for us Jesus saying, I will not leave you orphaned. I will not leave you orphaned. The word orphans, some of the most vulnerable, some of the most vulnerable need our attention. Need our eyes. The church founded to to care for orphans and widows and visit the prisons. The task of the church, the ministry of the church to care. And the reality is we all will experience vulnerability sometime in our life. And Jesus is reminding us, and it can be your hope, that there's a promise. I will never leave you orphaned, says Jesus. I will never leave you alone. And how is that? Because Jesus is alive and resurrected. You will see me, says Jesus. You will know the Spirit when the Spirit comes. Because you will see me. Because you sing, because he lives. The world may not see me, but you will see me. And lastly, in John 14, verse 21, may this be a foundation of your hope. I love you and will reveal myself to you, says Jesus. You will know me, and I love you. I ask the question, how does someone really know you? How does someone really know you? They know you when you risk. They know you when you risk and put their needs first and love them. Jesus says, you'll know me by keeping my commandments. You'll know me because you love me back. You know me because you'll do the work that I have done. 
And the need for change is a change of heart and the gift of spirit, not a change in the flesh or a change of appearance. So, oh Lord, this day, reveal yourself to us. Grant us salvation if we've never experienced a relationship with you, Jesus. Restore our souls and our spirits and lift us up again, helping us invest and believe and quick to defend. Our hope is in nothing less than Jesus. As we love one another and keep his commandments and forgiveness, we receive forgiveness and grace through the living, resurrected Lord and the presence of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray again. Oh God, reveal yourself to us today. In your spirit, may we be found gentle, reverent, and honest. May we see you again and quick to defend and speak in all that is bright and beautiful. Oh, may we as your church, as individuals and your community of faith, your people, your children, may we love and do as you have done. May we be eager to do good, pursuing and seeking peace, loving you with all our heart, soul, and strength, and our neighbor as ourselves. Thank you.